Hi Crossroads family, my name is Jorge Sucre, I am the Youth Director for CBC's Youth Ministry Crossfire and I would like to welcome you to today's service. Today we're going to sing songs to worship God, we're going to learn about scripture, we're going to spend time together in prayer and we're going to do church because this is a building, this is church. So welcome to church. Today we're going to continue our series on the Sermon of the Mount and I want to invite you to open your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 to 16. Remember, use your Bible, take notes, sing the worship songs, be involved in this ministry, be involved in this time with God. This is our time to do what we're being called to do, to do church together, to make disciples. So I want to invite you to be part of the service. So welcome. Good morning, Crossroads family. We're so happy you're joining in today. Nos encanta que nos estén acompañando hoy a la mañana. Qué bueno que pueden estar con nosotros. Si eres nuevo, te damos la bienvenida. If you're new, we're welcoming you. We hope that you feel loved. Esperamos que te sientas amado. And we hope that you find Jesus. Esperamos que encuentres a Jesús. Let's join in. Let's praise Jesus.
Hello, Crowder family. What a joy to be with you again today. I hope that during these weeks, you have had the opportunity to reflect on the calls that our brother and missionary Richard Tersey told us. Do you remember them? The first call is to know the King. This is the calling of salvation. The second call is to become like the King. This is the calling of, of discipleship. And the third call is to work with the King. This is the calling of vocation. Today, we continue with the presentation of, of one of our new missionaries, our brother Ivan Flores, who last week told us how his call was. And this week will tell us where God wants him to go, to take the message of the gospel. Ivan, you already told us why you interest in missions. Now, tell us, how has your process been to become one more missionary? I remember I made an appointment to talk to Pastor Steve about my desire and calling to serve in missions. I met with Ryan Skinner and Johnny Chacon. Ryan suggested I serve with Pam and Johnny told me about Juntos Podemos as well. I began preparing myself for missions by receiving classes, workshops, and others. At the end of this process, having been trained, mentored, and learned the language, here I am ready to serve in the mission field. I know you already have a missions project assigned. Why you don't tell the congregation about it? I am actually working in PAM as the administrator and have a role in IT department. I am the coordinator for projects of Bible translation for the indigenous people here in Panama. When do you start working on those projects? Last March, we wanted to begin on the Kuna border translation project, but we have been delayed due to COVID. The second one is with the Wunan. Actually, we are planning a meeting on this month to define some aspect and try to find a schedule to work. Ivan, how do you think your Crossroads family can support you? Well, first of all, I need prayer support that I may be faithful and steadfast in the Lord. And secondly, I need to find financial support to sustain the work on the mission field. Also, during the next three weeks, we will have our sister, Ruth Perez, who will be telling us her story and where God is calling her to go. Have a blessed week.
camino cumples promesas luz en tinieblas mi Dios así eres tú Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, Crossroads family, and welcome to another virtual Sunday service here at Crossroads Bible Church. I'm so honored and grateful and thankful for your being here with me again today. And as I think of today's service, I'm reminded that it was exactly one year ago, 12 months ago, 52 Sundays ago, that we started having our Sunday gatherings in this virtual format because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I think about that, uh, I realize that the majority of you guys have tuned in Sunday after Sunday for this whole year and I'm just blown away by that. I've heard so many stories from so many different pastors that have seen rapid decline over the past year in the number of people who are participating in their churches and that just hasn't been the case here at Crossroads Bible Church. So I feel super thankful for that and I'm honored and I just wanted to take a moment today to thank you guys for being here with me all this past year on Sundays and again today. So uh, thank you so much and welcome to each and every one of you. Today here at Crossroads we are going to continue to explore together the Sermon on the Mount, which is a sermon that Jesus preached and we find it recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. So I hope that you can have your Bibles handy and hopefully already open to Matthew, chapter 5. Uh, in this sermon, Jesus presents a really clear description of what his followers are like, or at least, you know, what we're supposed to be like. And here at Crossroads, Sunday after Sunday, we're discovering together a new aspect or a new facet of that really important and interesting description. So today I want to just quickly remind you of what we've discovered so far. So far we've discovered 
from the eight Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, thir- uh, 3 through 12, we've discovered from these eight Beatitudes that followers of Jesus are people who recognize their deep need for God, who are truly repentant of their sin, people who are humble, people who desperately want to obey God. They're people who treat others better than they deserve to be treated. They're people who are clean from the inside out. They're people who work for peace. And there are people who are persecuted for doing right. That's a really incredible description, isn't it? It's a lot to think about. And, well, we're just getting started with Jesus' description. As I think about these eight Beatitudes and the description that's already starting to emerge of what Jesus' followers are like, I wonder to myself, how does this kind of person who has been so profoundly changed from the inside out, how does this kind of person affect the world around him or her? Or stated in other terms, how do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live? How do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? And Jesus actually gives us a really clear answer to that question in the passage that we have before us today. So if you'd like to find out how Jesus answers that question, come on with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This is what it says. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So how do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live? Well, you notice, didn't you, that Jesus gives his answer in the, in the form of two metaphors. Followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live like salt and like light. Just as salt and light affect that with which they come into contact, so followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live as if they were salt and light. Today, when we think of salt, (laughs) most of us probably think of something like this, right? A salt shaker. Um, Today, salt is really common. It's really cheap. It doesn't have much value. But in Jesus' day, it wasn't like that. Today, if you go to any restaurant around town, you'll probably find a salt shaker on pretty much every table. Um, If you go to the supermarket, uh, you'll see that there's all kinds of different options to buy salt, and it's not very expensive at all. But in the ancient world, in Jesus' day, salt was extremely valuable. It was used, obviously, to give flavor to food. It was used to preserve food. Um, 
It was often used for medical purposes. And maybe you remember that um, sometimes the Roman soldiers were even paid in salt. Their salt pay was called in Latin a salarium, from which we get our word, word salary. So in ancient times, salt was really valuable. But sometimes the salt was so full of impurities that it had no saltiness. And so it wasn't really good for anything. It had no value. And so to get rid of this useless salt that wasn't salty anymore, people would throw it out on the paths and on the uh, trails like it was some kind of gravel. So when people heard Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount about salt, these are the kinds of things that they had in their minds when they thought about this metaphor. And now with this information in your mind, I want to invite you to listen again to Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. So followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live as if they were salt. That's what Matthew 5, 13 says. And then in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, we find another metaphor not only do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live as if they were salt, but they also affect the societies in which they live as if they were light. So today, when most of us think about light, we probably think about something like this, right? An electric light bulb. But in the ancient world, there was a lot more to it than that. It wasn't quite as simple as just kind of walking in a room and flipping on a switch. In the ancient world, people had oil lamps. The lamps had to be filled up with oil, then the wicks had to be trimmed, and then the lamps would be lit. So it was, it was a process. Once lit, these lamps were spread around people's homes and put up on stands. Sometimes the homes were even built with little shelves up by the ceiling or roof or little kind of cubby holes in the stone walls. But places were created where the lamps could be placed high in the home so that with one little flame, the largest space during the home inside the home could be illuminated by the light of the one single flame. And, you know, no one would have ever in their wildest imagination thought of lighting a lamp and then putting it under some kind of a basket. That would have been absolutely ridiculous, right? Because not only would the lamp not produce light for the home, but the fire in the lamp would go out because it would be starved of oxygen. So when people heard Jesus talking about light, this is what they would have had in their minds as they thought about that metaphor. And now with that information in your mind, I want to invite you to listen again to Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. 
So how do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live? Like salt and light. Just like salt and light affect whatever they come into contact with just by being salt and light, so followers, followers of Jesus make a difference wherever they are just because of who they are. I want to say that again. It's really important. I hope it can sink in. Just like salt and light affect whatever they come into contact with just by being salt and light, so followers of Jesus make a difference wherever they are just because of who they are. When I stop and think about what Jesus was teaching with these two metaphors, and when I stop and just kind of ponder, you know, what could this mean practically for me in my life today? Here are some of the kinds of things that I think about. Salt preserves. Salt preserves. So maybe today we followers of Jesus could be salt by doing our part to preserve the good in our society. Maybe today we could be salt by preserving the values of, for example, honesty and respect for authority and by being really good neighbors to those who live around us. Salt creates thirst. Salt creates thirst. So maybe today we followers of Jesus could be salt by creating spiritual thirst in people. Maybe today we could be salt by being so nice to those around us that they actually want to be like we are. Salt gives flavor. Salt gives flavor. So maybe today we followers of Jesus could be salt by making this world a more pleasing place to be. Maybe we could be salt by being friendly and kind, by not littering, and by saying please and thank you. Salt heals. Salt heals. Maybe today, we followers of Jesus could be salt by helping the hurting. Maybe we could be salt by being in some way helpful and encouraging to those around us who are struggling and who are discouraged. And let me tell you, there are plenty of struggling, discouraged people around all of us today, right? Light dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness. So maybe today we followers of Jesus could be light by giving spiritual guidance to those who are groping around in spiritual darkness. Maybe we could be light by looking for ways to talk with our unbelieving friends and neighbors and co-workers about spiritual things. Light brings hope. Light brings hope. Have you ever been in a place that's really, really dark and you didn't have any light? Like, I don't know, maybe a cave or maybe in the middle of a jungle at night? How did you feel? You felt hopeless, didn't you? But then you saw a small flicker of light. And it brought you hope because you knew somebody was nearby and that everything was going to be okay. Light brings hope when there's darkness. 
Maybe today we followers of Jesus could be light by sharing our hope of salvation in Jesus with people around us. Being light is doing good deeds. Being light is doing good deeds. That's what verse 16 is all about. By the way, Matthew 5, 16 is the memory verse for this week. If you're participating in our Bible memory project, this is the verse that you should memorize this week. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. In this verse, Jesus equates a shining light with doing good deeds. So we followers of Jesus shine our light by doing good deeds that draw attention to God. So the possibilities for us to be light are literally limitless. Whenever we do any good deeds in the name of Jesus, our light shines brightly. So, how do followers of Jesus affect the societies in which they live? By being salt and light. How are you doing with that? How is your level of saltiness? How brightly is your light shining? Are you blending in with the world? Or are you so different that you're making a difference in the world? Followers of Jesus are so different that they make a difference. What about you? Think about it. Let's pray. God, we pause again today and give you thanks for the opportunity to be together by means of this technology and for the opportunity to freely open up your inspired book, the Bible, and explore this little paragraph. Thank you for what your word has taught us today and reminded us of today. And God, we, we want to please you with our lives. We want to be excellent followers of Jesus. And so I pray that you would help each and every one of us this week be salt and light in our homes in our schools, in our communities, in our places of employment. God, just like salt and light affect whatever it is that they are around, I pray that we would be living lives that are so obviously different that we would make a difference wherever we go this week. Help us with that, I pray for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank you again for joining us today. We pray that today's message has spoken to your heart and maybe you want to share it with someone. It's never been easier to share messages. You can share it from this platform or from our Instagram page, which by the way, this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., Pastor Steve will be going on live on Instagram, so you may want to join us there too. Also remember to press like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so that we can get more tools to reach more people for the kingdom of God. Like always, we want to thank you for your support during this difficult time. It is a blessing and a privilege to continue working for you and for God's kingdom on, in Panama. At the same time, we want to invite you to contact us if you need anything, if you need any help, if you need prayer, we are here for you. You can visit us at our website and get more information on the different ministries that continue working thanks to you for the kingdom of God. 
Finally, we want to invite you to spend time in our lobby, in our virtual lobby. Send a message to a friend. Say good morning to a co-worker, to a sister, to a brother, to someone you haven't spoken to in a while. Remember, fellowship is very important and it can still happen. Thanks again for being with us. We pray that the Lord continues to bless you, to keep you, and to reveal His purposes for you during this historic time for the Church of Jesus Christ on Earth. God bless you, everybody.